to Anna and Dr. Dubrovner. I think I am uh, probably holding the record for the most uh, talks to GBI. I don't know. Anna will correct me. Maybe Dr. Dubrovner has given more talks. Um, so it's great to be with you. I am going to um, do my screen share. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do. Uh, everybody see my screen? Somebody nod? Great. Um, so I'm really happy uh, that we have so many high school students. I, I looked at the list. That's really terrific. Uh, also, some colleagues from Romania. And uh, you uh, may not know that my father graduated from the, uni the university uh, medical school. Uh, I'm sorry, grew up in Bucharest and then graduated from medical school in Vienna, not so far away, uh, where I've been on a number of occasions and was in Bucharest about a dozen years ago. So um, I have Romanian roots, which makes me really smart. Isn't that right, uh, Dr. Lita? Yes. Um, so uh, I am normally a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, not Penn State. Uh, Penn State has the football team. Uh, we have a football team, but it's a lot smaller. Um, and um, I am a professor uh, in medical ethics and health policy and in history of science. Uh, I'm a philosopher by training. Um, what I will talk to you about today is an area that I uh, have worked on for many years. And um, in fact, I, this particular talk is a summary of a course that I teach uh, for a full 14 weeks. So in about half an hour, I'm going to try to tell you some things about this field uh, that I work in uh, that will obviously be in inadequate. but. Um, uh, my plan is to, uh, to open it up in about half hour, 40 minutes. I'm going to go as far in my slides as I can go in that time. I do want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, and if you want to put stuff in the chat, that's fine. Lacey is going to help me keep track of that. But um, meanwhile, um, feel free to uh, ask me a question uh, after I get through some of this. So... Got to make sure that I can advance my slide. So um, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about a book I published in 2006 and again in 2012 called Mind Wars, uh, and more recently, uh, a, a book called The Brain in Context that I published with a neuroscientist. Um, I know you've had quite a variety of topics uh, this week, but I'm guessing that you probably don't know very much about the, uh, the uh, issues around ethics and brain science or neuroscience. And you probably know even less about issues in military medical ethics. And so I have a, a two hills to climb at once. I have to tell you something about ethics and brain science uh, and uh, military medical ethics. So this is a crossover conversation. So as you, uh, I'm sure, realize, we are in the era of big neuroscience, uh, big uh, government-sponsored uh, projects in many labs around the world. I'm just showing you two examples of this, the Human Brain Project uh, in the European Union uh, and the Brain Initiative uh, in the United States. But there are also projects in China, in Japan, uh, uh, in Australia, uh, in Israel, um, the brain, as one of my colleagues says, is hot. So um, my particular topic, though, uh, in, in my books and uh, my writings in the last, well, 15 years or so, has been about uh, neuroscience and the military. So before the year before I published the update of my book, Mind Wars, in 2012, um, the one I just showed you, um, this was this, the, the way that the Defense Department in the U.S. spent its money in cognitive neuroscience. Now, cognitive neuroscience is not hard brain science. It's not about the connections in the brain. It's really kind of you might think about uh, it's kind of the sort of psychology, the psychology associated with brain science. Uh, and the brain initiative that I just mentioned added a, a much more money to this, including $50 million at that time for DARPA. Uh, and you may not know that DARPA stands for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA is the uh, U.S. Defense Department's cutting edge science agency. And you can read a lot about DARPA online. Some of you may know, already know something about DARPA. Um, 
Also, in the last few years, the U.S. adopted a certain strategy uh, for uh, the direction of its military operations uh, that's been called the third offset. So the first offset was nuclear weapons. The, the second offset, an offset really means uh, asymm the asymmetry, uh, the advantages that we can have over our adversaries. So that was first the, 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 the bomb, the, the nuclear weapon. The second uh, uh, offset was um, directed weapons, computer-directed weapons, remotely-directed weapons in the 1990s, particularly in the first Gulf War. The third offset, as you can see, has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, right? And so a, a, su a sub-theme of my talk to you today is going to be about AI, about artificial intelligence. Um, so again, this is DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, they, have a, had a, they have this role in the U.S. Brain Initiative. I'm going to especially say something a little bit later about, uh, about this project, the Next Generation Non-Surgical Neurotechnology Project, or N3. So I'll come back to that a bit later. Not only DARPA, um, it's also an organization called IARPA, which is the Intelligence Community's Advanced Research Projects Agency. And I just want you to note that they too are doing neuroscience, right? Cognitive neuroscience architecture for understanding sense-making. And sense-making is a term of art in the intelligence community um, that basically has to do with how, if you're an intelligence analyst, do you make sense of all the information that's coming to you as an analyst? Uh, coming to you from newspapers and magazines, coming to you from the web, coming to you from the National Security Agency, which is uh, f seeing how our cell phones are connected to each other. A lot of, obviously, highly sensitive um, intelligence data. Um, and the Navy also, just briefly to show you this, also has a neuroscience program. And I, I, I want you to notice here that what the, what um, the ONR, especially the Office of Naval Research, especially is interested in is or information processing within neural systems. And what that means is, what can we learn from the brain that can teach us about um, how to make better AI? Uh, that is a major theme in the artificial intelligence world. It actually has been since um, the 1990s. Um, understanding the microcircuitry of the brain its thought may help us to make better artificial intelligence. So these are topics that I uh, talk about in my course. If you are, are um, if you come to the University of Pennsylvania someday, which I hope you do, the high school students, um, maybe you'll be able to take my course. Uh, I will not be able to get through obviously everything that I uh, go through in this class, but I wanna to talk to you about some of these topics, all of which work under what I call uh, the auspices of neurosecurity. So um, you were mostly not born, I think, the people in this group uh, before uh, the 1990s. But um, if you were back in the 1980s, you might have been living in a period in which the Defense Department was trying to teach uh, a few soldiers how to be warrior monks. And uh, the warrior monks were people who supposedly had the ability, using their their, their, their minds alone to do remarkable things uh, like walking through walls, using extrasensory perception, uh, psychic healing of their comrades in the battlefield. Um, there was a, a popular book and a film made by George Clooney uh, called The Men Who Stare at Goats. If you haven't seen it, it's okay. It's not fabulous. Um, but the idea in the, in the 1980s was could the U.S. Defense Department and by the way, I think the Soviets were also working on this, and perhaps other countries like Israel. Could you teach people how to use extrasensory perception uh, to be a superior, to be enhanced? Uh, now, um, I think they've pretty much given up on this effort, um, but I'm not so sure that there aren't some people in our military still interested in this concept. Uh, but actually, mostly what's dominated enhancement efforts recently has been drugs, especially a drug called modafinil, uh, marketed as ProVigil. Um, for generations, uh, people, particularly in pilots, have used pet pills or go pills to keep them alert and awake on missions. 
And now uh, it, those have been replaced. Speed has been replaced by this drug called modafinil, which the National Institute of Mental Health uh, has found can keep you awake and alert for 30 to 40 hours without any loss of intellectual function. Um, I think that those of you who still take final exams um, would probably be very interested in getting this drug. Um, this is only a prescription medication. It's, uh, it was approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in 1988 for narcolepsy, a sleep disorder. But it is prescribed by doctors. I'm not going to ask Dr. Dubrovner if he's ever prescribed this for people uh, who are long distance truck drivers who work in uh, uh, all night uh, for Amazon, for example, uh, or even professors like me who do crazy things like travel to China, give a paper, and then turn around and come back. Um, so it is, it is available uh, off-label, as, uh, as we say in medicine. Um, not only drugs, but also electrical stimulation. So here's an old New Yorker cartoon that I love. You can see this teacher in front of these nervous parents having the annual conference. I've been to those conferences. Uh, and this teacher is saying, we found by applying just a tiny bit of an electric shock, test scores have soared. This is not science fiction. In fact, transcranial magnetic stimulation or its cheaper version, TDCS on the, uh, the lower image, uh, is being done by people who they think they can make themselves smarter using uh, a little bit of an electrical stimulation. I don't advise this. Do not try this at home. But there are idiots, mostly young men, of course, because the, most of the idiots in the world are young men. Uh, I can tell you that because I was once one um, who are doing this and then blogging about it. You know, I, they give themselves a little jolt uh, with a nine volt battery uh, on their foreheads and they do some Sudoku and they think that their, their, their scores have improved. And they blog about it. You know, they're idiots. Uh, don't advise this. But TMS has been found to modify cognitive processes. No question about that. Now, um, a little bit about uh, how we could make warfighters into better team players. Um, would it be possible, and I've just taken this little quote from this one uh, Pentagon project, Biological Computer Programs in 2016, would it be possible to somehow have people speak brain to brain without having to point? If you could talk to somebody from your brain to their brain directly, uh, wouldn't that be an advantage, particularly in the battlefield? So there have been some interesting proofs of concept. Uh, University of Washington, uh, this is published, what, in 2013. Uh, this is a guy with, uh, uh, who's uh, got this cap on his head, and he's, um, he's about to uh, push a trigger on a computer screen. He's playing a game. And uh, an impulse is sent on the internet across campus in Seattle to somebody with a transcranial, transcranial magnetic stimulation cap. And that person picks up a signal from the first guy, a couple of graduate students having fun with this. Um, this is kind of brain to brain stimulation, uh, but it's pretty clumsy, right? Uh, using caps and the internet. Well, what if you could do it more directly? Uh, this is an experiment that was done at Penn um, by one of our former uh, assistant professors, a guy who's got a big lab now in India. And, and basically, this is what he did. Um, he's got a, a couple of monkeys who are, um, have, have chronic, uh, chronically wired into their skulls. They're getting a shot of juice. And without moving anything except using their intentions in their brains, one has got the red dot, one's got the blue dot. And if they can coordinate with each other to get that black dot in the middle of the circle, they get a shot of orange juice. That's their reward. So um, this is what you might think of as brain-to-brain -brain interface without hand controls being done in a couple of monkeys at Penn. So what about human beings? Well, for 20 years, um, a group at Brown University, started at Brown University, uh, has been working to implant uh, this kind of little chip into the heads of, uh, of people who have tetraplegia. That means that they have an injury, a pretty high injury, 
um, and they can't move anything. They can they can move their their facial muscles, but they can't move any of their limbs. And and this fellow was kind of a pioneer of this patient on the left in in being able to com- to control the cursor on a computer screen. Uh, and and if, you know if you can control a cursor on your computer, then you can manage your environment. You can turn the lights on and off. You can change the temperature and so forth. Um, that's pretty clumsy. Um, but perhaps it, it gives some hope. Now, uh, Elon, Facebook has announced a typing by brain uh, project. Um, a lot of promises going on here. Uh, Elon Musk thinks that he can do this. He said he was going to put chips in our brains by last year. That didn't happen. But actually, this concept has been around for a long time. This is a on the top. You're seeing an image of a Yale, Yale University Span, Spanish uh, Spaniard psychology professor named Jose Delgado. Uh, Jose Delgado put a a chip in this bull's brain. He got into a bull ring uh, in 1961 or 62, I think it was. This bull is charging at him. This is Professor Delgado on the right. And at a certain moment, he pushes a button on what he calls his stemoceiver, and the bull stops in its tracks. What's happened is that Delgado figured out how to flood the brain of this bull with so much electricity that it stopped. Now, um, that's kind of clumsy. I could do that to you as well. Really, not, not all that helpful. It's not really helping you to type, right? And whether that will ever be possible without invasive surgery, the kind of invasive surgery that that Elon Musk uh, wants to do ultimately, um, I don't, I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. But people are working on it. So back to DARPA. DARPA wants to have a brain implant that could record uh, from uh, a million neurons in your brain. Uh, and that, again, could help with prosthetics. If you lose the, the function of your limbs, that could be a fantastic thing uh, for people who are not able to move their limbs or, or have artificial limbs. Um, if we could do this non-surgically, that would be even better. So without actually putting in anything inside your head into your skull, uh, maybe we could do something on the surface of your skull. The problem is that those, 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 those electrical signals coming out of your brain are muffled by your skull. They're very hard to amplify. So this is difficult, but obviously you would prefer to do it non-surgically rather than pushing a, um, a cable into your head or uh, or using um, or sewing something into your skull the way Elon Musk has been talking about doing it. Um, this would be especially useful, again, back to teaming. How could you help people to do better teaming with each other in the field, particularly if they're soldiers? Um, so this is a human machine application in the, in the armed forces, potentially, about brain-computer interface. And here, again, I'm talking about N3, the project that I mentioned before. Uh, the idea here is that perhaps you could get to the point where you could have that kind of technology without a cable. Before they had a cable 20 years ago. Now, this is advanced to the point where there is no cable. That's very interesting. This is just sitting uh, slightly introduced into this man's skull. He also has a tetraplegia, right? Um, so how far could this go? We don't know. But potentially, there may be a way to put something on a soldier's head so that he or she could communicate with a fellow soldier wirelessly from brain to brain. Um, now, I'm going to just do a little history here because it's fun. Um, a different topic in this area is what we know of as brainwashing. I'm sure you all know about the idea of brainwashing. Um, L, the drug LSD, uh, the hallucinogen or psychedelic, as it's sometimes called, was suspected of being used uh, in 1949 in the, in the show trial of Cardinal Mangenti in Budapest. Uh, not sure that really ha- that was really LSD, but the CIA was really worried about this. There's a film called The Manchurian Candidate um, about brainwashing uh, and, and a couple of American POWs in, in Korea in the early 1950s. And what I'm showing you is obviously a heavily edited, heavily redacted document from the CIA in 1953 that talks about using uh, LSD and LSD antagonists, uh, spending $39,500 of maybe your grandparents, or in some cases, your great grandparents' tax dollars, uh, to try to understand if LSD could be used 
in a national security setting to brainwash people? Or can we protect people from being brainwashed um, by the use of LSD? That was the question. So the CIA did try this in lots of different ways in the 1950s and uh, early 1960s. Um, and you can read about this. Uh, this. A lot of this came out in 1975 in a report to uh, 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 President Ford, a presidential commission. Um, Operation Midnight Climax uh, actually involved uh, hiring sex workers in places like San Francisco to bring their customers back to their rooms, giving them a drink before their sexual activity and putting some LSD in that drink, not making this up. Uh, what would happen to these the customers of these sex workers if they were having a hallucinat hallucinatory experience on LSD. The uh, CIA operatives were behind a two-way mirror watching the events. Uh, and you got to give these people credit for a sense of humor. They called this project Operation Midnight Climax. Can't make that up. More, a little more sophisticated. Uh, can we manipulate people's trust behavior using a drug? Uh, we, you, you and I make oxytocin when we're having dinners with friends, we're in, we're in a trusting situation. Um, there's some work, mostly in Switzerland, to put oxytocin into people's heads uh, through the nasal root, sprayed in their brains, and then put them in a competitive gaming situation. Business schools have been doing this. Um, could you do this if you are, say, interrogating somebody? Would that be better than torturing them? Instead, you give them a little oxytocin and you make them more trusting. Whoever comes into the room to interrogate them is the good cop. Um, what about helping people uh, who may be in a situation that would give them traumatic stress? There is a, uh, a theory that perhaps beta blockers, which are used for people who have heart disease uh, to help oxygenate their heart better, perhaps beta blockers could be used to prevent post-traumatic stress disorder. Would it be ethical to give this to soldiers before they go into combat? Would they therefore not experience trauma, which is a lifetime disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, or on the flip side, would it make them forget in such a way that they don't have guilt or regret about the things they've seen or done in combat? Would we as a society want to have a cohort, uh, a generation of guilt-free soldiers coming home? Um, there are other ways to do these kinds of manipulations with, with implanted cables. I'm going to show you one experiment um, using something called optogenetics. This is basically taking opsin, which is a protein in your eye, uh, putting it into the brain, um, and then um, the, a group at Stanford about 10, 15 years ago uh, figured out how to actually control where the opsin goes and follow it as it goes around the brain. So in this experiment, this mouse is not hungry, but when they turn the light on, opsin is a light sensitive protein. When they turn the light on, they can, by putting the cable in the right place in the, uh, in the hypothalamus, they can make that rat hungry. Now, you don't have to put a cable in my head and turn a light on to make me eat salted buttered popcorn. I do that spontaneously, um, but this rat doesn't. So you notice when they turn the light back on, it's hungry again. Why do this to this uh, little rodent? Well, if you think about it, many people have eating disorders. So it might be that we learn something about the way the brain is wired up uh, to, to, uh, to need to be satiated, to need to eat, that may help people with eating disorders. I'm just showing you this, well, probably because it's fun to look at, um, but also because I think it really does say something about how much you could do if ethically you could do anything to people. We're not going to put cables in people's heads, but we can put them into rodents. Now, different topic uh, that worries a lot of people these days uh, that also has to do with brain science in the military, and that is the question of using artificial intelligence to make autonomous robots. Um, and uh, so I'm just showing you this quote uh, from the, uh, this, is, this is Robert Work, who was the most senior civilian in the Defense Department until a couple of years ago. And what he's saying here is, no, this is not about making robots that will fight other robots. We're not going to make robots that kill human beings. 
what we're going to do is we're going to help people, particularly in the military, collaborate with robots, human machine collaborative combat networks. Um, so this is not, although many people think it is, about making robots that can kill on their own. That's not what this is about. Um, what the problem here is that the, the speed of modern combat using artificial intelligence is so fast, it's so, the tempo is so high that human beings can't get up with it. So if you're a pilot in an, F, in an F-35, um, you are getting so much information for the computers on board your aircraft that you yourself cannot digest. The algorithms in the computers on board are, 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 are digesting information and then telling you what conclusions they reach as the pilot. And you are on the loop. You are deciding whether to let the system fire a weapon or not, right? You, you, are, you, are, you are still part of the system. Now, what that means is that we don't need to have human-level AI in order to do uh, this, create these kinds of devices. Human-level AI um, is what you see in a lot of science fiction if you read uh, people like Kurzweil, uh, or if you follow people like Elon Musk, or the philosopher Nick Bostrom, you know, there are a lot of people who think that we are going to develop human level artificial intelligence. I am not one of those people. But that's a separate topic. Um, what this says, though, is that we don't need to in order to have autonomous capacity. Now, instantly, you and I know what's going on in this picture. I don't think there's anybody in this virtual room who doesn't know what's going on in this picture. But if you were a computer, you would not understand what is going on in this picture, and you might well fire at one or both of these children. This is the problem with the idea of autonomy in artificial intelligence. No AI has, has the ability to judge, has the ability to appreciate context. You and I do, no AI does. So that's why there's a problem with uh, the idea of autonomous weapons. And it's a problem that, uh, that the Defense Department uh, and other defense agencies and other, other countries are very well aware of. And this is just a summary of how moral intelligence, dynamic moral intelligence, has to be part of the equation. And it is not part of the equation. There is no computer right now. And I don't believe there ever will be, given the way we do AI now that will be able to make judgments about what is going on in a situation like this, even though you and I got it instantly. Nobody in the room failed to understand what's going on here. There is no computer that has the dynamic moral intelligence to understand this. And we have no clue how to write a code that will instruct a computer about how to understand what's going on in this picture. No clue. Nonetheless, there are, are AI weaponized robots. Uh, you could read about this as they, this happens to be one made by Samsung. I have a nice Samsung TV uh, in my house. Samsung also made this robot that is in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between South and North Korea, where uh, President Trump and the um, ruler of North Korea met a few years ago. Uh, and this is a robot that if it wanted to, it could shoot anything in the demilitarized zone on its own. Now, we don't know what really happened a few weeks ago. This is being widely reported. Some of you may have seen this. This is a drone aircraft that apparently fired on its own. This is not an autonomous weapon in any interesting sense, any more than an arrow that I shoot into the air is autonomous. It is autonomous. When I fire an arrow into the air, it's going to go somewhere. This drone fired, it had its own target set, but it was not able to discriminate in, 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 between civilians and warfighters on the ground. This is dangerous. And this is the kind of phony autonomy that people are worried about. Now, I'm gonna give uh, you an assignment. I think there are probably of the high school students, especially, you may not have seen one of the greatest movies ever made. I think it's rated number 23 on the American Film Institute's list of the greatest all-time films. Uh, it's, it's considered a comedy. It's really a kind of a black comedy. Uh, and it's called Dr. Strangelove. And you must, you mu must absolutely 
watch Dr. Strangelove. Anna, make sure that all of the high school students watch Dr. Strangelove or they flunk the GBI course. Um, now, you, you may be happy to know that there are ethical principles for AI that were developed by the Defense Department. Um, and this, is a, this was published uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, artificial intelligence in dogfights. This, this is not autonomy. This is AI, but it's not autonomy. So, but there are ethical principles that were developed uh, in the previous administration to deal with the problem of autonomous artificial intelligence. Now I'm gonna end in two minutes. You'll be happy to know. I wanna tell you very briefly about a new project uh, that, I'm, uh, that I've undertaken on a grant from the Defense Department. We just got this grant last March. Uh, and you may be asking yourself, why would the Defense Department care about ethics? Actually, the Defense Department cares a lot about ethics because it has serious reputational concerns. Um, so um, my former postdoctoral fellow at Penn, now at the University of Massachusetts, uh, a, a young man named Nick Evans, along with his colleague there, Neil Shortland, formerly of British Special Forces, a psychologist by training, applied uh, based on an idea I had a number of years ago for a grant with uh, the Minerva Research Initiative in the U.S. Defense Department, a $1.1 plus million dollar grant for three years, uh, doing this also with Mike Gross, a professor of political science at Haifa in Israel. Uh, and this is the question. How can we use artificial intelligence with warfighters to enhance their performance? How can we do the experiments with them ethically? How can you do ethical experiments with people in uniform using artificial intelligence devices? So these, this is, these are the big questions, the big aims. Um, how to do ethical experiments with warfighters using AI-enabled devices, the brain-computer devices that I showed you a few minutes ago, for example. So um, there's been no investigation about how to, how to do ethical testing and implementing these kinds of enhancements using AI-enabled devices. That's what we're going to do in this three-year project we've just started. Um, so you know, this is the kind of thing you have to say in your application for a grant. Uh, this is how we describe why this is innovative. There's a lack of analysis about what ethical issues arise when these interventions are not clearly or centrally therapeutic. Now, remember, we're not talking about therapies here, right? These are not medical therapies. These are not making us sick people better. This is making healthy people enhanced, enhancing their performance capacities. So that's a big difference. Um, so this is what we're doing. Uh, I'm actually writing this first part now. We're doing an historical inquiry into the role of soldiers in testing novel interventions and technologies. And then we're going to go to commanders and soldiers and other and experts and find out what conditions they think should apply when you do these kinds of experiments. We're going to go to the commanders themselves and ask them what the ethical standards should be. Um, so this is the project. These are um, the books that my colleagues have already published. I showed you mine, Mind Wars. Um, Nick Evans at UMass as publishing this book just recently. Uh, the uh, fellow Neil Shortland is the co-author of this book on conflict. Uh, and Mike Gross of Haifa in Israel has published this book on bioethics and on conflict a number of years ago. So um, I wanna thank you for hanging around for a few minutes and letting me talk to you. And I'm gonna stop sharing and open it up. Questions, comments, outrage, gross fears about what's coming, all, uh, all perfectly acceptable. Anybody, jump in, yell at me. I love it. I love getting yelled at, especially by the high school students. I want the high school students to yell at me. Oh, the Romanians too. They can, they can do that too. I know Romanians yell, I've been there. And I know Analita, so. Unmute and jump in. Hello there. Um, I'm not a high school student, um, but I do have a question. Great. My question is, how competitive do you think that the United States, I, I recognize that there's not a whole lot of regulation so far into this space. Um, and you mentioned how sort of the ethical um, conditions are currently being set and 
um, kind of innovated at the moment. Right. But just kind of with our, how shall I say, the overall architecture of our legal system. Yeah. Um, and sort of how you think that these uh, regula regulations might be constructed. Do you think that the United States will in the future be as competitive um, in innovating into these sorts of technologies relative to other countries, um, perhaps China, perhaps other um, you know, near peer competitor countries um, right. in, in creating these sorts of technologies um, to, uh, you, to you, compete. You, Warren, you, can I ask what you do? Are you a medical student or what's your thing? Oh, no, I'm a master's student in microbiology. Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, you might well be working on biosecurity issues someday if you're not already interested. Um, it's a growing field, right, as we know. Uh, so um, everybody wants to know um, about, as you put it, our near our competitors, our near peers, uh, particularly China. Uh, is, is China going to be governed by the rules? Um, you know, the truth is that... Um, the, the, I'm going to do this very quickly, and we can talk offline more about this if you're interested. Um, the first mover has to be the one that sets the rules. And the truth is that in history, um, the U.S. has been the first mover in, in most asymmetric technologies, right? Pretty much all. So think about the bomb, right? Uh, we used the bomb in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki without saying what the rules were. Um, what are the rules under which, according to which we're using the bomb? Now, there is, as you probably know, a history of just war theory. It goes back to St. Augustine. Um, and we would like to think that we play by the rules of just war. Uh, but we, but there is, you have to specify the rules when you're using a new kind of weapon. We didn't. Um, we also haven't specified the rules just to jump to the, 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 the current era about cyber. Uh, we disabled um, the, the Iranian... Uh, system for making, uh, 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 for uh, purifying uranium for the Iranian bomb um, using cyber warfare. Everybody knows that. It was called Stuxnet uh, and uh, no longer a secret. And we didn't say what the rules were, right? So you, if you're the first mover, you need to say what the rules are. So I think it is, it is we can't say, oh, the Chinese aren't going to play by the rules if we don't set, say what we think the rules should be. Um, now, your other question is whether we can be competitive. Uh, you know, I think we can. I think we will. Uh, I also work a little bit in sort of international relations and national security. Um, I do think we're re-entering some kind of a, a world that more, looks more like the, uh, the Cold War era when we had a bipolar world. Uh, and I'm not sure that a bipolar world is a bad thing. Because since 1990 till about 2010, we had a unipolar world. How did that work out? Not so well. So the question is whether a bipolar world can be a more secure world in which each side, each dominant player, for example, the U.S. and China, can set the rules and require their clients and their allies to play by the same rules. Very quick answer. Very, really interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, you mentioned offset early on, and this is kind of like a mutually assured destruction, but to that. Indeed, uh, indeed. Um, and, and and the problem in Dr. Strangelove, the movie I want you all to watch, if you haven't, uh, is that um, in the movie, the Soviet Union didn't say what the rules were and didn't even say that the, that the, the doomsday device existed until it was too late. That's no way to run the world. I think Thank Dr. Brovner had a, had a comment. I've always been interested in the problem of how something as gross as electroconvulsive therapy can be uh, specific on treating depression and what kind of mechanisms are involved in that. Right. Uh, so, um, in fact, uh, this is something that has interested me personally because my, I have a late aunt who had ECT a uh, number of times because she had a history of manic depression, starting as an adolescent. Uh, uh, in fact, my father was a psychiatrist. That's how my parents met, uh, because she was looking for a psychiatrist for my, 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 aunt, my, my late aunt. Uh, my mother was. So, um, you know, there, there are people who believe that, first of all, ECT is not what it looks like in, in, uh, in some of the movies we see, right? Um, but it is, as you say, pretty gross. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, not a physician, but... Um, 
there are people, as I'm, you no doubt know, who believes that transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, which I mentioned in my talk, could be a substitute for ECT uh, because it doesn't, it should not properly uh, used cause a seizure. Um, I don't, I, I must say that I'm trying to find out uh, what advances there are in that area. Um, you know, but as you know, uh, depression is the biggest problem in the world uh, of the disorders. Depression is the biggest problem. Uh, so um, if it's not electrical stimulation of some kind, um, you know, uh, we're looking for new medications. Uh, and by the way, side project of mine, as you may remember, is I'm very interested in the history of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Uh, and, you know, I know you know something about that as well. And it's very exciting uh, if we do it right this time to see how, uh, how uh, some of the so-called psychedelics are now in clinical trials to see if they actually do moderate depression better than the drugs and the psychotherapies that we have. Thank you. Thank you. And great to see you, Dr. Dubrovner. Hopefully in the flesh again next year. Absolutely. Jump in. Anybody else? Hi, I have a question. Um, yes. So uh, one thing I'm a bit puzzled by is the um, article on the quote-unquote autonomous drone. Um, so why do you think inf misinformation like that is so prevalent and what is the motive behind it? Well, you know, I think, okay, what do you do? Can I ask what you do? I'm a high school student. Oh, you are great. Um, so look, I think the problem is that we are stuck with some words uh, that um, we don't know, know what they really mean when we use them. And, and the word autonomy is a problem, right? So, um, you know, an, an engineer has said to me a few years ago, uh, a defense department engineer who makes uh, weapons that kill people on the ground. Uh, I said, you know, can we use this to use the word automatic? What's, what, what, what's wrong with the old fashioned word automatic? Autonomy has cap captures our imagination, right? Because we are autonomous as human beings. Uh, and we attribute these properties to devices that are called autonomous, but they're not really autonomous. Um, so I think that this is part of the problem, Akari. It's not just a matter of, I mean, the reporting in, in legitimate places like the New York Times is pretty good, but we are stuck with some language that is misleading. Uh, and that I think is is a is a big part of the problem here. Uh, as to that 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 drone in Libya, I, I don't think we I still don't think we know exactly what happened. Um, but if that drone was able to do its target selection and fire a weapon um, without any human monitoring, uh, that to me would be a violation of the rules that we have implicitly now. Uh, we we need to make those rules explicit. But making those rules explicit is really hard. You have to do an international treaty. Those treaties take years to write. And, um, you know, the United States does not like to sign on to treaties. We follow treaty, the rules of treaties. We don't like to sign on to them. So that's, a, that's another problem. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, hi. Um, hi. I was intrigued by your discussion of... Uh, communications between soldiers like on the battlefield using this neurotechnology and it made me wonder about how this neurotechnology could be used um, in situations like interrogations and um, situations where you need to get information out of someone and right. I was wondering what your thoughts were on like the ethics surrounding that and how that should be applied. Well I told you that that story which is a true story about the way the CIA used LSD uh, to see if you could actually um, get somebody to talk, right? Um, and I and you know, the, the, look, uh, this is what I tell my students: the best way to get somebody to tell you things that they don't want to tell you, sex and alcohol. Best way, give get them drunk and off them sex. I mean, you know, sometimes the old ways are the best, and in fact, it's pretty hard to defeat the old ways in most cases. So. Um, you know, I think what people discovered was that um, these kinds of exotic drugs, they didn't really, they didn't really help that much uh, if you're trying to do an interrogation. What an interrogation is about, it's not what, like, you know, the TV shows where it's not like that. And, and, and I, have wor I have worked with uh, intelligence officers who've done interrogations. It's about rapport. It is about establishing a relationship with somebody. There's a, 
uh, um, a CIA agent wrote a book about this. How he how did he get uh, a, an operative to talk? They exchanged poetry. They did this over weeks and months. Right? That's you 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 establish a hu real human relationship. That's how you get somebody to talk. It's not like twenty four. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right? Uh, if that's your way to find out about, about a ticking bomb, you're in the wrong business. It doesn't work that way. So we can talk more about this in it, but it, it is a very interesting. And obviously, you know, extremely controversial. Uh, but it, sex and sex and alcohol are better than waterboarding, and Bye. more fun. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Lisa, I think you were had your hand up first, and then Maxie. Um. Yeah. So I am also a high school student, so I'm not going to yell at you, but I did have a question. <laughs> I think typically My robotics. Yell at me, so if you come to Penn, you can you can yell at me. Okay. okay. Anytime. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, I please. think typically like robotics and STEM, like, you know, like mechanical engineering is associated with a more objective and I guess like reliable, like, I don't know, association. And do you think that with AI that also holds true? Like, do you think that there would be less, like fewer variables to test if we start leaning into using more AI and more like, machine learning technologies in the military well so the the there's an inherent the inherent limitation to the way we're doing ai right now and you know this is a long conversation right um the inherent limitation right now is that basically what uh, ais use is um inferential reasoning right so you know you see a thousand white swans and you conclude oh they're all white right except they're not right uh this is that's that's the way that AI operates now. Massive amounts of data and it looks for patterns. But the patterns, like the notion that there are no black swans, may turn out to be, you know, your prediction may not turn out to be wrong. Uh, so this is an inherent limitation of artificial intelligence. And it's why, jumping to my conclusion about this, that the current approaches to AI will never get to human level intelligence, let alone superhuman intelligence. Because again, you and I know that there might be swans of a different color, but a computer has no way of knowing that because all it's doing is keeping track of the swans it's already seen. So, um, you know, this is this goes back to the problem of context and judgment. So, uh, so look, folks in the in in uh, in uh, these national security systems, they know that these are inherent limitations of AI. So they are trying to keep human beings in the loop in the decision-making loop. It is difficult because, again, the speed of modern conflict is so fast that um, you and I can't process as quickly as an AI. But an AI's processing is limited because it lacks, again, judgment. So I'm not sure I've really answered your question, but um, you know, this is a, it's a, that's a partial answer. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Maxi, and then Andre. This is less about the technology, but I was like curious if you could go into more depth about uh, what you said about a bipolar world actually not being so bad. Were you speaking in terms of like technological advancements? Because obviously there were, I mean, wartime, you got a common enemy, you know, easy technological advancements or like more like societal advancements too. You know, I'm not I'm not an IR person, and I probably international relations person uh, or a political scientist. Um, but I talk to those folks, and um, you know, this is not necessarily a consensus view. Um, but I but a, a, there is a view, as I said, that um, the Cold War was a rel if you think about you know, oh yes, there were proxy wars like Vietnam, right? Um, and yet there was no World War Three. Now, I know that sounds like a ridiculous trade-off because, you know, what, nearly 60,000 um, soldiers and Marines and sailors died and, 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 and pilots died, Amer Americans died in, in the Vietnam War, and God knows how many Vietnamese died. We have no idea how many Vietnamese died, hundreds of thousands, you know, maybe a million, right? Um, but there was no World War III, <laughs> right? Uh, we are now living in, in, a, in an extremely unstable situation uh, in which a cyber attack could be misinterpreted. Uh, so this is why some people in international relations are saying, you know, we are probably drifting toward a, a bipolar globe. Uh, and that may not be a bad thing if 
if each pole of the globe can, as I said before, create a, a, an environment that is stable, that can make its allies and clients play by the rules. So I'm not sure I'm really answering your Now, technological advancement. So let's just talk about that for a second. Um, the Soviet Union was very good engineering and math. Uh, very good, right? Up to a point. Um, but um, for various reasons, th there are other areas in which they weren't so good. And, um, and, and, and for, you know, they weren't very good, for example, in applying nuclear technology. You know, we, we know it happened about Chernobyl, right? So um, uh, there are some instabilities that, that occurred during the Cold War that we hope would be rectified by a more competent competitor in the case of China. The other thing about China is we are not going to disconnect from Chinese science. Forget about it. Look at any major article in the life sciences. There are American names and there are China names. Right? These labs are working together. This is probably what, what's going on with Wuhan right now. We are so interconnected in science with China. Also, our, our trade with China is insane. You, Amazon would have to close down tomorrow if we stop trade with China. So we are not going to, to cut China off. The, there was very little trade between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. Maybe, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, probably not even that. We are tens of billions of dollars in trade with China. So, you know, uh, advancements, innovations through the military, through the private sector, they're going to continue. And we are and we are not going to disconnect from China, which makes it more interesting. But in a way, it's kind of a good thing, right? Because we can't completely disconnect. All right, thank you. That was just a perspective I hadn't heard before. So, it's my job. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what Donna's paying me for. Um, I think uh, I'm not sure. I think Andre and then Annette and then Warren and I'm be told yes. if we have time. Morning. I have a question is, um, will scientists map people's brain to death for dying patients? I mean, because there are cases where the quality of life is very low and how ethical would be that? Right. Um, you know, I think, are you, are you, where are you, by the way? And what I'm do you from do? Romania. Uh, and you're a, a grad student, a medical student? Uh, I'm a radiology and imagistic student. Great. Okay. So... Uh, I, I think what you're referring to is um, uh, the question whether people who are unable to communicate, uh, who are in what are called mim minimally conscious states, yes. uh, these are people who not only can move a muscle, like the people with quadriplegia or tetraplegia uh, below their neck, they, they absolutely uh, don't appear to be aware of their environment. Now, some of these people are in vegetative states and they're not aware of their environment. But there are people, it seems, and I'm not the authority on this, um, uh, but there are people, it seems, uh, who um, are unable to communicate with, with us. Uh, nonetheless, they, they are somewhat aware of the environment. And, and, uh, they, but they are locked, it's called locked in, right? <laughs> so if you're in a locked in state, uh, and if we could actually give you an implant that would allow you to communicate, uh, would we ask you the question, do you want to, do you want to continue to live? Right? That, that would be one way to put the question that I think, I think this is what you're getting at. Uh, and that does raise a great ethical dilemma. Is that a question that we would want to ask them? Because if we did, would we want to know the answer? Uh, so um, I think that's the issue, right? And that a lot of people are very concerned about that. Um, but we are only now beginning to do the experiments and develop the, the brain science that allows people uh, to measure what's going on in the brains of people who appear to be locked in or to, or maybe in a minimally conscious state. Uh, and on and, and Dr. Dubrovner undoubtedly know my friend Joe Finns at New York Hospital at Cornell, uh, who is an authority in this area. Um, but it's it, it, this area is has moved along very quickly in the last 10 years doing those kinds of measurements. But we still don't in this area. You know, there's this philosophical problem called the problem of other minds. Um, I don't know exactly what you're experiencing right now. You don't know exactly what I'm experiencing. 
uh, I asked this question because my uh, I saw that at my grandma, my uh, grandpa, sorry, my grandpa. Your grandfather um, yeah. had, was in a, you yeah. might have been in a locked in state. Yes. Yeah. For right. two years. For, for years. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, it, it, uh, I'm not the I'm not the neurologist, but uh, you will be perhaps the neurologist who knows more about this. Uh, but there are many people who are in vegetative states uh, who have no experience in the environment uh, at all, uh, and they're being tube fed, right? Uh, probably not on a ventilator. Um, but but there are, if there are some of these folks who actually are are aware of their environment, that poses a horrible horrible existential problem. Um, okay, so Thank let's you, see. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Uh, Warren and then Annette. Warren? Future in biosecurity. Well, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> but it seems very interesting. I there'll had a question. Of, there'll be a lot of work in biosecurity, Warren, after, uh, after this. I'm telling you. Think about it. About Go it. ahead. Um, my question is kind of, so you went over basically the, um, the innovative pr progression um, of these sorts of uh, brain technologies um, used in a military application. Um, and you've mentioned how kind of now the area that we're moving into is more related to AI and, and the use of technology, whereas historically um, there was a lot of um, research and development on using um, external um, even 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 chemical um, 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 drugs and 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 um, and things of that yeah, nature to, to influence right, right to, to influence um, uh, performance of soldiers um, and and human beings yeah and as we move into this more AI inclined world um, and you know with the advent of the internet and whatnot um, what do you think has more promise is there still a role for that sort of um, more traditional um, chemical induction of certain um, yeah, physiological responses that can be advantageous um, in that yeah, way. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, for all of the talk about drug enhancements, um, there's really not much. You know, the best preparation for your, your final exam uh, is uh, get a good night's sleep, you know, get plenty of protein, uh, exercise, um, even uh, Adderall, uh, there's no evidence that, although I know, I'm sure none of the students in this class use any of these drugs inappropriately, uh, but, uh, you know, some of your friends might uh, off label without a prescription. There is no evidence that Adderall or Ritalin improves your academic performance, but people like to think it does, right? Maybe it does as a placebo. Uh, maybe it makes them more confident, but there's really nothing it, it, uh, modafinil, do, which I mentioned, uh, you know, does keep you awake and alert longer. So it's probably good, you know, if you're if you're cramming. Um, but you know, for many people, coffee works just as well. So I uh, now, uh, on the other hand, Warren, if you're working for the U.S. Defense Department or the Chinese People's Army, and they say to you, "You're a microbiologist. Go make us a better drug to help our soldiers be smarter." You will say, OK, sir, and you will try because that's your job. If you're in the in the defense business, you will try anything you can to get an asymmetric advantage. So I'm not saying there's no future for drugs uh, in performance enhancement, but so far it's been surprisingly difficult. Uh, Annette. Uh, hi, I wanted to go back to that and idea. Adam. Sorry. No worries. Uh, I want to go back to that idea of communication between uh, soldiers on the battlefield, like using different types of neurotechnology. Um, it kind of brought up a concern that I remember like reading about with Neuralink, where like the potential consequences of something like hacking, like would be like very like, you know, catastrophic. And I was wondering if you think that this is a risk that um, is possible, like how much of a risk it is. And yeah, it's really easy to hack. That is a huge problem. It's really easy to hack these signals. Um, look, in principle, you you can you can hack uh, cardiac assist devices. Right? This is a this is a problem when when uh, Vice President Cheney uh, got his cardiac assist device 
um, they 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 were they and they I'm sure they they were then and I don't know he's not in power so maybe it doesn't matter anymore but they were definitely worried about hacking and hacking is a problem uh, it's going to be used as a, as, a, as an again as an asymmetric defensive measure uh, if this stuff gets fielded no question about it uh, there and, and I mean there's just you know you'll have to, so that this is what happens with an arms race right. We create these devices and then somebody figures out how to hack them and we make a new device. If you look at the history of gas masks, for example, from from mustard gas uh, to uh, modern uh, gases like uh, like uh, sarin gas, uh, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to get ahead of the other guy. Uh, And um, so that's what will absolutely happen. So that's good. Good. Good question. That's going to be a problem. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, um, like, what would that even look like if a soldier, for example, were to get like a hacked, like, um, like message or something like that? You no, know, it could it could make him or her fire their weapon in the wrong direction. Uh, it could just be very confusing. It could give him a headache. Uh, it could cut off communication with colleagues entirely. Somebody on the next block who's, you know, uh, uh, it could do all it could do all sorts of things. It's a good question. Adam. Yeah. Uh, uh, two really quick questions. Uh, one, what's the rate of innovation uh, for the government, uh, or the military uh, research labs versus the private sector? The rate of innovation, did you say? Uh, yes. How, how do the rates of innovation uh, compare for uh, DARPA versus uh, the private no, sector? That, that's re- uh, I don't know. How, I don't know how you, what the metric would be for a rate of innovation. Um, it's not like more, you know, we have Moore's law, right, which is this sort of doubling uh, memory capacity every 18 months or so. Um, Moore's law is not a law, really. More, it's just an observation. <laughs> it's an historical observation. Um, so there's a there's a kind of a rate of innovation. Uh, I don't know how you'd measure it, really. Um, w- one thing that's changed uh, since uh, the Cold War is um, that the private sector is more and more important. It used to be that uh, a lot of the ideas went from uh, from government science into the private sector. You know, private. You'd give them. You'd ask them to do something for you. That still happens, like DARPA. But um, now, so much. You know, you think about Google and Amazon and um, uh, and Facebook and so forth. So many of these internet-based technologies are being done in the private sector, and the and the and the defense community is racing to catch up. Right. Just think about what's happened with the social networks uh, and how those that cre- has created an incredible problem with national security. So um, I, I guess in general, I would say the rate of innovation has been greater in the private sector since the Cold War. Again, I'm not sure what the metric is, right? But I, I think it's I think you could say that. Um, uh, so that is a change from the cold from the Cold War era. Um, you know, one problem, Adam. I don't. I want to get to your second question. One problem right now is that um, the private sector can pay a smart young engineer so much more than the U.S. government can. So work, workforce is a big problem. Uh, Google can pay uh, a, a 24-year-old engineer several times as much as the CIA can. And by the way, if you work for Google, you don't get asked uh, if you smoke pot, uh, whereas if you work for the government, you do. And that's a rule out, right? So the, there are interesting workforce problems here, too. And I'm not going to ask you, Adam. So what's your second question? Uh, second question, uh, you talk a lot about uh, the mental side of drugs uh, uh, for improving uh, performance. You, yeah. said some, you said it's not so clear about the benefits. But what about uh, drugs for the physical side? I follow a lot of professional sports. I know a lot. Of, uh, there's a lot of doping. Uh, has there ever been no, talk about no, doping? no. God forbid. Yeah. You're kidding. Okay. Yeah, I know. But uh, has there ever been discussion about giving uh, giving uh, steroids to soldiers to improve their physical performance? Yeah, I mean, look, those guys, I can tell you that those guys take a lot of a lot of stuff. Uh, they take everything they can get their hands on, any creatinine, right? Uh, they'll definitely take that stuff. Uh, like, you know, of course, right? Um, but, um, you know, the you can only, there's, there are people who've won the Medal of Honor who are shrimps like me. Uh, there are people who, people do incredible things in crisis situations that that have very little to do with physical performance 
uh, combat is such a crazy, confusing s- when it's hot. Uh, and I've never been in combat, but I know bunches of people who have been that it's really the brain that, ta- that has to take over, not the body. Um, so, yes, of course, physical endurance is definitely part of the story. But uh, co- the cognition is critical. Um, but in general, of course, yeah, pr- performance enhancements, physical performance enhancements, you know, they're doing all the same thing, and they, all the same things that your friends with the wrestling team are doing, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Or, or, any, or, or any weightlifters are doing. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, all that stuff can have its own price, right? By the way, um, I don't know if you read this horrible story about a George Mason University freshman baseball player uh, who died in Tommy John surgery a week ago. Uh, Tommy John is supposed to be a routine surgery for pitchers, um, and um, he died. Nobody knows what happened uh, yet, but obviously, you know, there is no such thing as safe surgery. So, even these kinds of physical enhancements, you got to be, um, you got to be careful about them. All right, thank you. Sure. Well, thanks, and uh, you know, look forward to seeing you, some of you, in in the real world someday. <laughs>